Hello, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm starting a new series here on my channel where I read and discuss different romance novel genres and the best books in them according to you. But first I want to take a second to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Book of the Month. They've been using Book of the Month off and on for the past couple of years that I have been on booktube and I feel like of all of the book services out there, Book of the Month is easily my favorite. I love that their team vets hundreds of books each month and I don't really have to do the guesswork of picking out books, especially in genres that I am a little bit more out of the loop on. I think like 90% of the thrillers that I have picked up over the past couple of years have been Book of the Month selections because I know that whatever Book of the Month picks is going to be fun, it's going to be buzzworthy, and I know it's going to be one of those books that everyone is talking about. I think y'all know that that's pretty important to me here on my channel. I love reading what's new and popular. Now this month I chose two books that I'm really hyped for, You're Invited and The Bodyguard, the latter of which is actually one of my most anticipated romances of 2022. You're Invited is a thriller that immediately caught my eye, like I said previously, book of the month, they really do their thrillers right. It's about a lavish Sri Lankan wedding that our main character is desperate to stop from happening because her ex-boyfriend is actually the groom. But maybe she won't have to do as much as she previously thought to get this wedding to stop because the bride, her former best friend, ends up going missing. And then we have The Bodyguard, which is a romance where our heroine is hired to be the bodyguard for a superstar who I believe she ends up developing feelings for. I've really loved Catherine Center's writing in the past, and I want to say this is her first foray into a true contemporary romance, and I'm really, really excited to give this one a try. I'm also really excited because when I'm not reading this month, I'm going to be tuning into Book of the Month's new podcast, Virtual Book Tour. The podcast is hosted by Brianna Goodman and Jared McFarlane, who are members of the editorial team at Book of the Month, and the podcast is basically them interviewing some of the authors authors of the books that are featured in the book of the month selections. And I've really enjoyed listening to the episodes that I have listened to because they're the perfect length at around like 25 to 30 minutes. And I love hearing authors writing process and or what makes them inspired when they're writing because I want to be a writer one day myself. If you want to learn more about the virtual book tour podcast or you want to try book the month out for yourself, I'm going to leave a link in the description to both. And if you want to get your first book from book of the month for $9.99, use code sunny. If you want to hear my full thoughts and feelings on either of these books, come back at the end of the month for my July wrap up. And thanks again to Book the Month for sponsoring this video. Now I was inspired to do this video after watching a couple of videos from one of my favorites in the beauty community, Allie Glines. She asks her subscribers what their favorite beauty products are in a particular category. And she breaks down the top 10 for her subscribers so that if you're on the hunt for like a new concealer, you can find a perfect selection based on the way that she describes each of them. Now I'm hoping and endeavoring to do that here today, but for particular romance book genres. So my goals, I have four, I'll let you know what they are, uh, are to give you a place to start in a pretty overwhelming genre as a whole. There are so many different subgenres of romance, where to even begin? Next, I want to let you know what a lot of other people tend to enjoy and what these books are about in general. I also want to let you know which of these books I think are suited for which people. What kinds of things you're into definitely dictates what books you should be picking up off of this list. I'll try to break it down for you based on tropes that I see in books that maybe will draw you to certain books over others. And then my fourth goal is obviously letting you know how I feel about these books. I'm going to try to be kind of unbiased in my early descriptions of the books and then let you know slowly over the course of the description like how I felt about these books. Some of these are all-time favorite romances for me and some of these I didn't personally end up enjoying but maybe you will so I'm gonna try to be unbiased a little bit uh, but also ultimately let you know how I feel about these books. So let's go ahead and get started. I don't want to ramble too too long. In the 10th place slot the book that got quite a few recommendations over other books but is still sadly in the 10th place slot is Lord of Scoundrels by Loretta Chase. Right off the bat I am very happy to see this book on the list at all because it is one of my all-time favorite historical romances and I hope that in some part this romance is on this list due to my own recommendation of it in other videos. This book is about Jessica and Dane and Jessica at the start of the story is trying to get her brother out of a bit of a pickle. He is not the brightest shall we say and he is in France kind of gambling away the family fortune. Jessica of course is not down with this. She's a very intelligent very shrewd woman and she doesn't want to get married so she needs to ensure that the family fortune is well taken care of. Now this proves challenging obviously because her brother is gambling not by himself but under the influence of the dastardly Duke of Dane. Dane is described as sort of this handsome brute who has a very interesting past and a very interesting backstory. But after meeting Jessica, he is kind of determined to woo her, but also stay away from her at all costs. He's very physically attracted to her, but he knows that he has no desire to settle down and marry. Jessica, on the other hand, she knows what she wants and she is very much willing to go after it. She sees something in Dane that the other ladies of the town might not necessarily see, and she knows that the only way 
way for her to be with him is to marry him. So she goes about doing this in very creative and inventive ways. And there's just something about Jessica being the ultimate scammer and manipulator that I kind of love. I feel like oftentimes we see the men scamming in these historical romances, like getting a marriage of convenience, get the woman of their dreams and like convince her that she should be with him. We have very much the opposite situation here. We have Jessica who is smart, she's shrewd, she knows what she wants. She also, for some reason, is really into antiques and knows their value more so than anyone else around her, which is kind of cool. And she gets Dane to fall for her hook, line, and sinker in just the way that she wants. That's not to say that this book is without conflict. Obviously, Dane kind of goes kicking and screaming when it comes to getting married to Jessica in the first place. And their marriage at the beginning, especially, is very tumultuous. And they have a lot of different conflicts in their early married life. But I loved seeing the way that they interacted. I loved, again, seeing Jessica being that strong, determined heroine that we don't often see, in my opinion, in historical romances. I also feel like this book stands out from other books on the list because it is one of the oldest and it definitely feels older than the other books on this list. Which is not to say that it is bad or super problematic as compared to some of the other old historicals that I think tend to get a bad rap. This one is chaotic and it is messy, but it does have that sense of adventure that I feel like is sometimes lacking from some of the more contemporarily written historicals. If you like banter and you tend to be drawn to enemies to lovers stories, I think you really should give this one a shot. Obviously go into it knowing that this is one of the older historicals on this list. The writing feels a little bit different. I personally adored it. I ended up giving it five stars and it is no surprise that it is one of y'all's favorite historical romances of all time. Another book with a very strong and determined heroine comes in at our number nine spot, which is Nine Rules to Break When Romancing a Rake by Sarah McLean. This is one of two books on this list that I had not really heard of before going into this video, and so I got to read something new and fresh and exciting, and now I get to tell you my thoughts and feelings on it. Now, this book follows our very strong and determined heroine, Lady Calpurnia, who, like many romance heroines, is a spinster not looking for love. After many years on the shelf with no real prospects, Calpurnia is ready to kind of make her own way and maybe shed this good girl persona that she's had for a very long time. But her plans of adventure are not not easily won as Callie is asked by one of the few remaining crushes that she has to shepherd his sister into polite society. Lady Calpurnia has this very untouched reputation. Even though she's a spinster and like no one seems to want to marry her, a lot of people really respect her opinion, the way that she carries herself. And so this gentleman comes and is like, hey, my half sister, she's coming from a different European country. I think it's Spain or Italy or something like that. She doesn't really know proper English society and how things are done here. Can you teach her the way? Because Callie is kind of a people pleaser, she decides, okay, I'm going to do this this, but I'm also going to go and break the rules. Kind of like the title of the book implies. And this gets Callie into many a tricky situation. A lot of the time she ends up getting into encounters, I guess you could say, with her crush. She ends up going to a gentleman's club and ends up meeting him there. She wants to fence against a real opponent who happens to be the guy who asked her to watch after his sister, the Marquis of Ralston. I think if you're a fan of adventure and you really like a strong heroine, there's a good chance you're gonna like the story. Now, it wasn't my personal favorite because I feel like at times our heroine was not quite as self-assured as I wanted her to be. I'm someone who just really doesn't love an insecure, unconfident heroine, but I know that that's something that doesn't bother everyone. It's just like a personal thing of mine. And I will say also, if you're someone who really likes stories that have a lot of like meet cutes running into each other in kind of weird circumstances, you'll like the story. I know that seems like oddly specific, but I do know a lot of y'all enjoy meet cutes and or want a lot of interactions between your hero and heroine you're gonna definitely find that here in the story. This also seems like a pretty good place to start if you're new to the genre. It was very accessible and honestly a pretty fun read. While I absolutely adore books like Lord of Scoundrels and that sense of adventure and those kinds of heroines, that's not the type of book that I would necessarily recommend to a newbie historical romance reader. It's more of a seasoned historical romance reader recommendation. I definitely would recommend this book if you are someone who likes all the things that I mentioned before and you're kind of new to the genre. I believe I ended up giving this book three stars. It wasn't the most memorable or most fun romance that I've ever read, but it is one that I can understand why a lot of people enjoy. Next up, we have the first of two books on this list written by the beloved historical romance author Tessa Dare. In spot number eight, we have The Wallflower Wager, which when compared to all of the other books on this list, in my opinion, is pure sunshine. Tessa Dare excels at writing historical romances that are not only swoon-worthy, but are also super, super easy to consume, very page flippy, if you will. And for that reason, I totally understand why two of her books are on this list. This book is about our spinster heroine Penelope, who is absolutely gorgeous, but 
that is a wallflower due to her anxiety and some things that have happened in her past. Also, she's a bit of an eccentric in that she lives in the city, but she has farm animals in her house with her. And as cute as those farm animals are, they've turned off some of Penny's neighbors. This proves tricky for our hero, Gabriel, who ends up buying the house next door to Penny and is determined to basically do the olden days version of house flipping. So Gabriel takes it upon himself to try and help Penny rehome some of these animals. He's able to kind of recoup his investment in this property. Penny, while she is reluctant to get rid of some of these animals in her charge, uh, is falling quite quickly for Gabriel and is kind of willing to do whatever he says at the very beginning of the story. But as the story carries on, Penny really develops a confidence that I really, really appreciated. She ends up going for what she wants in the sense that she is the one to actively pursue Gabriel. He is very much attracted to her as well, but she is the one that is kissing him and making her attentions and affections known, which I really appreciated. It is kind of uncommon in a historical romance, but I think given Penny's past and some of the trauma that she's endured, it's really, really exciting to see her gain this newfound confidence. Now, I will say I reread this book for this video in specific, and it did feel a little bit lacking in the relationship development department, especially in comparison to the other Tessa Dare book that I read for this video, but it is no less charming even after reading it a second time. There's just something so delightful about Tessa Dare's writing that I don't think I can fully sum up. Besides, again, saying that her books are swoony and easy to consume, there's just something about them. There's magic in them, and I think if you are, again, new to the historical romance genre, this is a book that you definitely don't want to miss. And I think if you were specifically looking for a really good beach read in a new genre, this is a book that you should definitely pick up. Completely switching gears at number seven, we have The Highwaymen by Kerrigan Byrne. This romance is for lovers of angsty tension, dangerous situations, and lost and then found childhood loves. This book opens up with a scene set in the past where we have our heroine Farah marrying her childhood best friend Dugan. Flash forward to adulthood and Farah is now working at Scotland Yard, helping the police with administrative work when she comes into contact with the black heart of Ben Moore, Dorian Blackwell. He's a powerful man with a lot of secrets and he is determined to keep Farah safe after someone is coming after her and threatening her life. I'll leave the synopsis there because I feel like the charm of the story is all of the twists and turns and wild things that happen in the plot along the way. This book was so much fun to read and I feel like it is the perfect page turner if you are someone who typically reads a lot of thrillers or a lot of fantasy stories. Now I will say with this book and also with the book that I just talked about, The Wallflower Wager, I do think it's important to look up the content warnings for these books because Kerrigan Byrne tends to lean into some of the darker sides of life, the very gritty sides of life in her stories and this book is no exception. There is some violence that I think some readers might find a little bit unsettling so definitely look into that before picking up these books but again I think if you're someone who does like thrillers, you do like fantasy and you're not looking for kind of the light and fluffy side of historical romances, I think Kerrigan Byrne could definitely be an author for you. I ended up giving this book four stars. The only thing that kept me from giving this a full five was that I feel like some of the twists and turns were a little over the top for me at the end there. There were maybe one too many plot twists, which I know some people will not complain about at all. So I did want to just mention that, but that is why I give it four stars. I can understand again why so many people seem to love this book and why it is recommended so highly and why it is one of your top 10 historical romances of all time. Switching gears yet again, I hope you're not getting whiplash, my friends. We have Edenbrook by Julianne Donaldson. Now, this is another one that I feel semi-responsible for it being on this list because this is a book that I don't shut up about. It is one of my all-time favorite historical romances and all-time favorite romances in general. I do have a video talking about my top six romances of all time that I'll leave in the description down below if you're curious about my faves. This one is just such a delight. It is probably the fluffiest and least explicit book on this list, but just thinking about this book personally makes me smile. And again, I like to think that a lot of y'all also like this book and it makes you smile because it is number six on this list. Now, Edenbrook is about our sweet, naive heroine, Marianne Daventry, who is invited by her twin sister, Cecily, to come to this country estate. Cecily is intent on kind of wooing and keeping the attention of the Duke of Edenbrook. At least I believe he's the Duke. He's the heir of Edenbrook for sure. I know that. <laughs> Marianne, being the good sister that she is and craving the country air and the country environment, decides that she is going to go and visit her sister. But unfortunately, on her way there, she is accosted by a highwayman. Quickly, though, we know that Marianne is out of danger because she is saved by a mystery man who we come to find out is Cecily's intended. I don't think they're actually betrothed at the start of the story, but Cecily definitely has her eyes set on the heir of Edenbrook. And Marianne, throughout the course of the story, is having to kind of contend with her feelings for her sister's, like, crush. And she's also having to deal with her complicated relationship with her sister. And I think that's personally what makes this book so special to me, is the sister relationship. It felt very authentic to a sister relationship. I feel like they're kind of hit or miss in stories, but in this story in particular, I just really loved Marianne and Cecily's relationship, the way that they accept each other and know 
that each of them have their own like special gifts and don't let that kind of stand in the way of their relationship. I just really, really adore that. And then when it comes to the romance, it is one of those like Mr. Darcy hand flexing, like stares across the rooms kind of romances. Like I mentioned earlier, like there isn't a lot of explicit, like, you know, fun times, if you will, but it has this ultimately delightful whimsy. Marianne is kind of a naive character, but just the zest for life that she has, all of the twirling that she does throughout the course of the story, it just makes for a delightful read. I often pitch this book as like Anne of Green Gables meets Pride and Prejudice because Mary Anne is very much an Anne Shirley type, but the relationship here is a little bit Pride and Prejudice because it's like forbidden in a way. I will say our hero is definitely not like Mr. Darcy. He's not a typical grumpy hero, but again, I just, I adored the story. I love almost everything about it. I gave it five stars and I am very happy to see it on this list. A book that I was much less happy to see on this list in the number five slot is Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. Thankfully though, on my mission to reread some of the books for this video, I decided to pick up Bringing Down the Duke. Now I had read it previously and given it two stars. Really wasn't a fan of the way that this book was plotted and the hero upon first read, but I will say that upon second read, I ended up enjoying the story a lot more and I started to understand what y'all see in the story. This book is about our heroine, Annabelle, who is kind of in a tricky situation. I think she is the daughter of a vicar or something like that. And she is taking care of, I wanna say like her cousin or something that is in charge of the family home. She's not in a good situation, she's not loving it, but she is able to convince her cousin that she should be able to go and study at Oxford. While she's there, she quickly gets embroiled into this idea of women's suffrage. And Annabelle makes it her mission to convince this duke that she runs into one day that he should vote in favor of women's suffrage. Unfortunately though, Sebastian, our hero, doesn't want this to happen because of some circumstances that I don't want to detail here because it's part of the plot of the book, but they are circumstances which I found more convincing this time around. Sebastian's objections to women's suffrage in this book, while very self-interested, weren't actually based on any idea that women were inferior in some way, which is kind of how I interpreted or read this book to be the first time. And I will say, I actually did kind of find myself to be charmed by Sebastian and Annabelle's interactions. This book did have some pretty good banter and some pretty good dialogue. I do think sometimes there is kind of a lack of interactions between hero and heroine in romances. You'll get to be in the heads of the characters and get a lot of their internal thoughts, but you're not getting a lot of dialogue. And here you definitely get a lot of sufficient dialogue to understand why these characters would want to be together. I also feel like if you are a fan of Pride and Prejudice, there are a couple of scenes in this book that kind of harken back to Pride and Prejudice. So I think if you're someone who likes classic stories and or you are someone who tends to lean into the more like literary fiction side of things, you might enjoy this book. This still isn't a favorite of mine due just to personal preference. I'm not really into like political sprinklings in my historical romances, but I think if you were looking for a Goldilocks story that is neither too dark nor too fluffy and yet doesn't take itself too seriously, I think you're gonna enjoy this book. And spot number four, a book that I'm very unsurprised to see on this list, especially taking into consideration the time period in which I collected these votes. We have The Viscount Who Loved Me by Julia Quinn. This book is about Viscount and Antony Bridgerton, eldest brother of the famous family, as he fights his feelings for the spinster elder sister, Kate, while simultaneously trying to romance Kate's younger sister, perhaps the more appropriate choice between the two of them, uh, Edwina. Now I will say, while I understand why this book was nominated, especially given the whole Bridgerton show frenzy, this book is actually not that great when you have just freshly watched the second season of Bridgerton, and also when you have recently read the first book in the Bridgerton series, which makes this book feel like a bit of a retread. Antony and Kate's relationship in the book is another marriage of convenience, just like in The Duke and I, which is the first book in the Bridgerton series. It has another kind of clueless man trying not to fall for the woman that he is married to, and a heroine who is mostly just waiting around for the hero to wise up. This book was exhausting and a little boring, and at times totally silly. I'm looking at you beasting scene. Now the Bridgerton books are absolutely fun, marathonable, I totally understand why people enjoy the series, but I can't help but think about all of the other historical romance series out there with very similar plot lines in that we have the whole like each sibling falls in love in their own respective book sort of thing, i.e. like the Hathaway series. It does it so much better in my opinion than this series. I ended up giving this book three stars because it absolutely wasn't terrible. It was very palatable in fact, but the romantic relationship, which I feel like the book is supposed to focus on given that this is a historical romance, was just never something that I personally rooted for. If you want something angsty and swoon worthy and forbidden, I beg you to watch the television show and then after that I beg you to read a different historical romance series because you're gonna get the in my opinion better version of Bridgerton on the big screen. Don't need to read the same thing but not as exciting 
in book form. Now in spot number three is another book that I knew very little about before going into this video. And frankly, I kind of wish it had stayed that way because I did not enjoy Never Seduce a Scott by Maya Banks. Now this book starts interestingly enough, and I will say the plot of the story is definitely different than a lot of historicals I've read, but there was just a lot that kept me from loving it. So let me try to break it down. Never Seduce a Scott is about our main character, our heroine, I wanna say her name is Eveline. And at the start of the story, after a very traumatic accident, she loses her hearing and she also stops communicating via speech. Now, our heroine initially was betrothed to a man of her own clan who ends up kind of deciding he doesn't want to marry her after this accident and now she thinks she is safe from ever having to be married until one day the king of England decides that she needs to marry a man from a rival clan to quash the beef as it were. Now this Scottish man from the rival clan he is actually a lot more charming than we think at the very beginning of the story. Evelyn as a character is just very misunderstood by all of the people around her and he doesn't think that she can really communicate or understand the things that he's saying. He quickly understands that that's actually not the case and he develops his own way of communicating with our heroine until she is finally brave enough actually to speak around him. Now I will say I did appreciate the romantic elements of the story. I really did again like the way that our hero and heroine communicated. I thought it was really charming that our hero was willing to see past what other people were saying of the heroine and to really communicate with her for himself. Um, he could have easily just said you know what no I want nothing to do with her because you know she is from a rival clan and he's being forced to marry her but he quickly falls for her and is really really into her. Is she really lies? with our heroine and the way that she is treated by the people of the rival clan. The clan she marries into is rude to her like consistently so rude to her. They force her to do manual labor and kind of like trick her into it. She really just wants to be accepted for who she is and accepted into the clan, but no one is willing to give her a chance. And this happens time and again. I think the fact that she is so naive and so gullible really works against the story for me. It was honestly heartbreaking to read about our heroine like constantly facing this antagonism from the people around her. Like these people are supposed to be her new family and yet no one is willing to accept her. I mean, it makes sense given the context of the story and like the enemy clan thing, but I figure after like, she shows her true colors and shows that she is willing to do the work and be nice to everyone that they would be nice back. It just never seems to happen. And it also didn't feel like our hero did enough to help our heroine in these situations. So ultimately, I just couldn't give this book more than two stars. I understand why people like it. It is a unique story. It is set in the Scottish Highlands, which I know is a setting that a lot of people tend to enjoy. And again, I think the romantic elements of the story for the most part works pretty well. But if you're someone who tends to have the same hangups about stories that I do, you don't really like a heroine who is meek and timid, I don't think you're gonna totally love this book. So surprised to see it at the number three slot. Now moving on to the one book that I did not force myself to read for this video, Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. One of the OGs of time travel romance and one of the books that I think sparked a lot of people's interest into these like Scottish Highland warrior sorts of tales. Outlander is about time traveling baddie Claire who is married to a man named Frank in the present day until one day she ends up walking through a magical boulder and is taken back to the time of Scottish lords in kilts. Pretty hot stuff. Seriously, no, I really, I do think it's pretty hot. Uh, Claire is obviously a little confused and freaked out at the beginning of the story, and she is quickly saved from imminent danger by our hero, Jamie Fraser, who she ends up becoming romantically entangled with. Are we shocked? Are we surprised? Uh, my friend on Goodreads Bentley, I think, does a really good job at summing up what doesn't totally work about this book. And I feel a little weird saying what doesn't work about this book because I have not read the story in its entirety, but what I did read of Outlander the one time I did attempt to read it, I feel like Bentley kind of sums up very nicely. I think the biggest thing really is that this story is a book about an affair and I think that it's kind of funny and or sad that the villain of the story just so happens to look like Claire's husband in present day. So as to justify her cheating, mm, I don't know. It's it's quite it's quite the choice. I really, like I said, I don't have much to offer here because I didn't finish the book but I have watched the entire first, second, third seasons of Outlander and from what I could tell from what I read of the book, it is a less interesting and less exciting version of the show, which I feel like very rarely happens, but sometimes shows do it better, as evidenced by Bridgerton. Is it is it so the case that the show and movie adaptations of these things are better? Hating Game by Sally Thorne? After by Anna Todd. Let's be honest, the after movie is not that much better than the book, but, but I still, I think it's arguably a little bit better. I digress. I have it on pretty good authority that the characters in the book are watered down versions of the characters in the show. I feel like the characters in the show are perhaps updated for a modern audience. Claire has more gumption and more of that like modern sensibility that I think a lot of people are looking for in a story like this. And honestly, I just like didn't feel a reason to read a 600 page book and the show could definitely suffice. Now you could totally disagree. Maybe you wanna read a 600 page time traveling fantasy romance. I just don't. 
personally. So I don't have a star rating to give this book. I don't know if I can wholeheartedly recommend it or tell you not to read it. I will let you know though that there definitely is violence and the consent in certain scenes I believe is kind of dubious according to Bentley's review and a couple of other reviews that I've read on Goodreads. So that's something to know going into it if you do decide to pick this up. But I would recommend to you to just just watch the show. Just watch the show. A book channel is telling you to watch the show. You should watch the show. And lastly, with 21 votes, by far the most number of votes of any of the books on this list, we have, can you guess? The Duchess Deal by Tessa Dare. Now, the first time I read this book, I absolutely adored it, and I was brought into the world of historical romance for the first time. I want to say this is the first historical romance that I ever read. After reading the other books in this series, I was thinking like, mm, you know what, is the first book really that good? Is it really that special, that memorable? Upon reread for this video, I can wholeheartedly say yes, yes it is. It is fantastic, and it is a historical romance unlike any other. It has fluff, it has heart, it has swoon or the moments, and again it has that Tessa Dare magic that I don't think I can fully put into words. Though I will attempt to tell you what the book is about. So this story is about our heroine who is a dressmaker, I believe her name is like Emma or something like that, and she is charged with making a very elaborate wedding dress for this woman who is betrothed to a duke. Unfortunately this woman calls off the betrothal when she sees her intended is very physically scarred. Our dressmaker Emma is like, you know what, I need the coin, I still need to get paid for this job, so she shows up in this elaborate wedding gown on the Duke's doorstep. And the Duke, while he isn't really keen to pay our heroine after this kind of ordeal he's been through, you know, being jilted, he is excited at the prospect of potentially marrying Emma because he thinks she's charming and beautiful. I'm like, why not? She's there, she's in the dress, let's do it. Now, Emma, uh, being not poor, but definitely not like well-to-do society lady, is like, you know what? Okay, I'll marry this guy. He proposed, I'll do it. It does take her some like, you know, debate. She does ask her friends if she should do this, but she does eventually decide to marry the Duke of Ashbury, I wanna say. We're just gonna call him Ash from here on out. And this book is really about the two of them kind of coming together after this marriage and really falling for each other and being able to like confess their, not deepest darkest secrets, but their desires of their heart. You know what I mean? Like their emotional trauma, their baggage, having to put that on the other person and have them fully accept the other person. I mean, what, what else is a romance for if not to be able to admit your deepest darkest truest feelings and desires. This story, like I said, it's just charming, it's swoony, it is beautiful, it is romantic. There is just peak humor and banter in the story too that I think is replicated in some of Tessa Dare's other books but is kind of unmatched in this story. I think newbies and seasoned historical romance readers alike will enjoy the story because of, again, that unexplainable Tessa Dare charm. I gave this book five stars, are we surprised? And I have multiple copies of this book on my shelf, so clearly it is a favorite of mine. The fact that this book, despite not being my favorite on this list, is the number one spot actually does not make me upset at all. It is a fantastic story. I understand why so many of you love it. So I would recommend picking up the top spot on this list, The Duchess Deal by Tessa Dare. So those are the top 10 historical romances of all time according to you. Did any of these books or their spots on this list, like their rank position, surprise you? Also, what is your favorite historical romance of all time? I would be very curious to know if it wound up on this list or if it did not. Let me know again in the comments down below. And lastly, if you want to participate in the second video in this series, that I do here on my channel and you want to give me any recommendations for contemporary romances, fill out the Google form that I'm going to leave in the description of this video. No YA books, please. That is my biggest gripe. I hate having to like go through my list and delete any YA titles out of there. Also, if you could exclude any like dark romances or mafia romances, I'd really appreciate it. I am intending at some point to do a dark romance version of this video. So let's keep the contemporaries a la It Happened One Summer or like Beach Read by Emily Henry. Those are some good examples of what I'm kind of looking for. Uh, I'm really excited to to see what y'all think the best contemporary romances of all time are and uh, to read any of the ones that I have not already read. As always, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for watching this video. I love y'all so much and until next time.